By this stage in the course, you're beginning to figure out that you need to know a lot of the physics that you learned last, uh, last term. Uh, this is kind of one of the great things about physics, is it's a coherent body of knowledge, and things that you've learned long ago in your training is still useful for solving problems um, today. Despite the fact that you're learning new stuff about electricity and magnetism, it's the combination of your entire physics training that allows you to do interesting and more complex problems. So let's do one example of this. Uh, let's actually project ahead a little bit and show how it's going to be useful uh, in the future. Um, you're going to study modern physics in the next term, and there you'll learn about something called the Bohr model of the atom. Uh, this was developed by Niels Bohr in the early 20th century as one of the early ideas about how atoms are put together. It's the classic picture you carry around in your head of what an atom is. It's a proton with an electron orbiting around it, and I use that word orbiting very explicitly. It means orbit in exactly the same way that we meant orbit when we studied gravity during first term. So in the Bohr model, the attractive force in the atom is not the gravitational force, it's the Coulomb force between the electron and the proton. And it's that central force, that centripetal force from the Coulomb uh, attraction that keeps the electron orbiting in the hydrogen atom. Okay, so if the electron's orbital distance is 5.29 times 10 to the minus 11 meters, what we'd like to know is what is the orbital speed that it has as it goes flying around the proton in the atom. Okay, so that's a straightforward calculation. It requires you to use knowledge from last term as well as knowledge this term. And the key thing that we need to remember from last term is that the centripetal force is the force that causes the inward pointing force in the orbit. So in this case, what we will write, much as we did last term, is that the centripetal force is some other force, and in this case, it's the Coulomb force. Okay? And what makes this problem possible is that we have an expression for the Coulomb force, but we have a very general expression for the centripetal force that relates the motion of the orbit to the strength of the centripetal force, where the strength is given by the Coulomb. Okay, so in this case, what we know is that the centripetal force is given by the centripetal acceleration times the mass in the problem. This will be the mass of the orbiting body, which is the electron. And we know that the centripetal acceleration is given, the mass of the electron, is given by v squared, the orbital speed, which is the thing that we're interested in, divided by the radius of the orbit. So this is the general form of every centripetal force that describes circular motion. So we're going to use that on the left hand side here. So this is the mass of the electron times the speed in the circular orbit divided by the radius of the orbit. And now I have the Coulomb force, which we know. So this is Coulomb's constant times the magnitude of the two charges involved, which are the proton and the uh, electron in this case, divided by their separation squared. Okay, so let me do a little bit of algebra first rather than uh, putting numbers in. It's always better to do algebra first rather than putting numbers in so you don't have to go back and calculate those numbers, punch them into your calculator over and over again, especially when you get into problems like this where you have numbers with lots of exponents that have to be punched into the calculator and you have lots of powers and fractions and lots of numbers that have to get multiplied together. It becomes very tedious to accurately punch it into your calculator every time. And so it's much more useful to do it algebraically first if you can. Okay, so what we're interested in is the speed. That's what the problem asks us for. So we're trying to solve this V here. Okay, so this R will get moved over to this side equation and canceled with one of those R's. And this mass of the electron will get moved over to this side of the equation. So if I do that algebra in one step, I'm left with V squared on the left side. And on this side, I'll get K q1, q2, okay, divided by the mass of the electron times one power of r. This r cancels one of those powers of r. This m goes to the denominator. Taking the square root, I get that v, the thing that I'm interested in, is the square root of k Q1, Q2, 
over the mass of the electron times the radius of the orbit. Now there's an additional uh, simplification here because I know that the absolute value of the charge on the proton is the same as the absolute value of the charge on the electron, which is just the fundamental charge E. And so what that means is that Q1 times Q2 is just E squared. Okay, so if I were to combine that with my expression for V, then I see that V is equal to the square root of K E squared over M E times R. Okay, and there's a further simplification. You could pull that E squared outside of the square root if you actually wanted to. Okay, so let's put those numbers in. So V, in this case, is equal to, let me go to square brackets to indicate the square root so I can write everything out. K is 8.99 times 10 to the 9th Newton meter squared per coulomb squared. E squared is 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs squared. The mass of the electron, which you can look up, is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And the radius of the electron's orbit is given in the problem. That's 5.29 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. And that whole thing is to the square root. And if you do your dimensional analysis, and you punch the numbers out, you'll find that your final speed is 2.19 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. Okay, that's 2 million meters per second. So in the atom, the electron is really whipping around the proton at quite high speed. This is yet another indicator of how the things we're studying are kind of well outside our everyday experience. It's very rarely, if at all, that you ever encounter something that's moving at a million meters per second. Okay, so we'll do another problem sometime. Good luck.